For most of us as Americans, cars are a very big part of our lives. You think about it. Uh, we spend huge amounts of money on our cars, right? Second only to our house, our homes. Uh, and, and we spend lots of time in our cars, whether it's traveling to work or on vacation or, or wherever we're going. Uh, we like driving. And uh, we even define people uh, by the cars that they drive somewhat. I mean, think about it. D don't you think a little bit differently about someone who's driving a Prius versus someone who's driving a pickup truck? You know, there's a different impression there. Uh, yeah. Now, whatever, whatever car you drive, it's completely worthless without one small item, right? If you lose it, you won't go anywhere. You have to have your car key. Uh, and for some of us, that can be a struggle, right? We tend to misplace those or lose them or, or uh, uh, lock them in the car. But that key is what makes everything in your car work. Well, when we think about Christianity and we think about the Christian faith, the key that makes everything work is the resurrection of Jesus that we're celebrating today. But just like with our car keys, I think it's possible to lose sight of the resurrection. It's possible, in a sense, for it to get even misplaced. Um, I was shocked this week. Uh, I was looking at, at, at everything I had in, in my personal library on the resurrection, and I was shocked that one of my favorite authors in a book about the essentials of the faith, he didn't have a section on the resurrection. It wasn't there. It, uh, now, I'm sure that it was an accidental thing. I mean, I know this person believes in the resurrection and would say that it's very important. Um, I, I think it was an accident. But in other cases, the resurrection gets left out intentionally. Some people, uh, some people don't want to bother with history or, or theology. They just want something practical. Right? They want to talk about uh, little tips to help your marriage or to help your parenting. Uh, and I, I get that. I understand that. But they can, can just leave out things like the resurrection. Or other people are, are skeptical about anything miraculous or supernatural in the Bible. And yet what we have to see, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, Paul says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. So you see, there's no resurrection. I mean, there's no Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus. So why is the resurrection so important? What, what is it about the resurrection that makes it that key? Well, this morning I want to share with you what I'm calling a beginner's guide to the resurrection of Jesus. These are the things that I wish someone had, had explained to me when I first became a Christian. I didn't grow up in the church, and so things were new to me. And these are the things that I wish someone had said. Uh, what I see is that the Bible presents five reasons to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And so if you're not, if you're not sure what to think this morning about the story of Jesus rising from the dead, if, if you have doubts about that, uh, I want to encourage you to listen to these reasons with an open mind. If you do believe, I think these reasons uh, will help you think about how to apply the resurrection of Jesus in your life, how it should shape how you live. The first reason that we come to is what I'm calling the, the promise. The promise. As much good as there is in our world, I think we all sense in our hearts that life isn't the way it was meant to be. Right? The Bible says that God made us to live forever. And to live in a perfect world without any suffering. But when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, life became broken. It fell under God's curse. And so all of the pain, all of the suffering, all of the conflict in the world, it's all a result of that original sinful choice. And so at that time, God had every right to destroy all of creation and to start over again. But instead, He promised to fix the world. That's the promise I'm talking about. It's the promise that runs throughout the Bible uh, from the very earliest chapters. Now, God's plan for fulfilling His, His promise was to raise up a perfect king. 
Someone who would rule the world forever and, and bring everything back into line with God's uh, will, with God's design. And so the Old Testament talks about how God laid the foundation for this to happen. He came to Abraham in the book of Genesis and, and promised to make his descendants into a great nation that would, would bless all the families of the earth. And as that nation took shape, God worked through Moses to reveal his, his law to guide them. And then later on in the Old Testament, God chose David to be king and, and promised, tying into the same idea, that promised that the perfect king would be one of his descendants. But there are some obstacles that have to be overcome for God's plan to be fulfilled. And one of those problems is how any human king could rule forever. And that must have been on King David's mind. Because he spoke of it in one of the Psalms that he wrote. Psalm 16, verse 10, says this. He says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. That was about a thousand years before the time of Christ that those words were written. Now, later on, uh, in the New Testament, after Jesus rose from the dead, the Apostle Peter looked back to that verse in Psalm 16, and he, he described it this way in Acts chapter 2, verses 29 through 31. He said, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. See, his point is that uh, David wasn't talking about himself there in Psalm 16. So he says, Verse 30, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. Verse 31, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Those words are from Psalm 16. And so in order for God to fulfill his, his promise, that descendant of David had to be raised from the dead. He had to come back to life in a body that would no longer be subject to death. So God's promise, His entire plan, throughout the Old Testament, it all hinges upon the resurrection of Jesus. That's the promise. The second reason is what I'm calling the, the claims. Uh, a few months ago, I suggested to our elders and deacons here at, at Calvary East that we consider expanding our lobby, um, that we remove those walls back where our, our nursery used to be. And you should have seen those guys' eyes just light up. The prospect of tearing down walls just <laughs> seemed to do something to them. They were energized. Uh, um, why? Because it's, you know, it's one thing to build something, that takes effort, but tearing something down is, is easy. And so Jesus used that idea early on in his ministry. It was during one of his confrontations with the Jewish leaders. Uh, so this was three years before Christ was crucified. He went to the temple in Jerusalem at the Passover. And what he found uh, deeply offended him. He found people using that, that special holiday, the Passover, to take advantage of the worshipers who were coming. Uh, they were selling sacrificial animals at a marked-up price. They were uh, charging people money to exchange their currency for the coinage that was used in the temple as they brought offerings. And so what did Jesus do? It tells us in John chapter 2 that he made a whip. And he drove those money changers and people selling those animals, he drove them out of the temple courts. Now, Jesus did the same thing again three years later. Uh, but on that first occasion, the Jewish leaders challenged him. And they challenged him to show them some sign that would demonstrate his authority to, to do that. And so here's how Jesus responded. John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it. Verse 20 says, the Jews then said, it's taken... 46 years to build this temple, will you raise it up in three days? Easier to tear down than to build something. Now, Jesus didn't respond to that. But later, his disciples figured out what he was talking about. So John explains to us in verse 21. 
and 22. He says, He was speaking about the temple of His body. When therefore He was raised from the dead, His disciples remembered that He had said this. And they believed the Scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So as the time for Jesus' death drew near, He repeated this claim that He would die and that He'd be risen from the dead. He repeated it at least five different occasions that I find in, in the Gospel of Matthew and also listed in the Gospel of Mark. So, for instance, in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, it tells us that from the time Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised... So his first statement about the temple, that was, that was maybe a little cryptic. But, but here, he, as it gets closer, he becomes very clear. And yet somehow it just doesn't sink into their minds. Uh, I mean, Jesus even claims, we looked at this verse last week, that he has the power to lay down his life and the power to take it back up. And so in light of claims like that, you can only come to one of three conclusions about Jesus. Jesus. You either have to say he was crazy, that he was a liar, or that he was a lunatic, or that he was a liar, or that he's the Lord. Right? The disciples saw the resurrection as God's confirmation that Jesus is Savior and Lord. Now, the third reason that we see in the Bible, we've talked about the promise and uh, the claims of Christ. Thirdly, the witnesses. In a modern court of law, it only takes one credible witness as sufficient proof to convict someone. Just one. The Old Testament required two or three. Because right? it knew that people don't always tell the truth. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 3-8, through 8, Paul records a much bigger list, much more than two or three people, who saw Jesus after He rose from the dead. Now, look, here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And then he adds this, And that He appeared to Cephas, that's another name for Peter, uh, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And he says, Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now, Paul doesn't include there even the very first person to see Jesus after he rose from the dead. Uh, in John's Gospel, he tells us that Mary Magdalene saw Jesus. So you have all of these witnesses... You know, in a, in a court of law, that's, that's sufficient to prove the case, to confirm that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Now, the question, of course, is, are these really credible witnesses? Well, the evidence that we have to their credibility is that they were willing to suffer persecution. They were willing to suffer martyrdom, to die because they believed this, this truth. They believed in the that Jesus rose from the dead. They refuse to deny that. And so their testimony stands as, as compelling proof of the resurrection of Jesus. Now that idea of being a witness, that's central to the mission of the church. Uh, in Acts chapter 1-8, as Jesus was preparing to ascend into heaven, He said this to His disciples. He said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. See, the way that he describes that mission, it's, it, it goes beyond uh, those original eyewitnesses. That work is bigger than what they could accomplish over the span of their lives. And so believers today continue to tell others the testimony of those first eyewitnesses. But in addition, we add in our own personal testimony of the effect that Christ's death and resurrection has had upon us. Now, as we'll see as we continue on, these next two reasons that we'll look at this morning, 
Um, that evidence should continue to build in our lives as people see a spiritual transformation that comes about in us because of our belief and the resurrection. So what does the resurrection then mean for us? Well, that's, that's where our next two reasons go. Uh, reason number four is the hope. You know, prior to October 14th, 1947, people thought it was, a lot of people thought it was impossible for people to travel faster than the speed of sound. But it was on that day that uh, test pilot Chuck Yeager, flying the X-1 rocket plane, broke through the sound barrier. Uh, now that accomplishment opened the way then for thousands of people to fly at that speed, and whether it be in military planes or even commercial planes like the Concorde. Um, now, by his resurrection, Jesus broke through a barrier, not the sound barrier, but the barrier of death. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 22. Here's what he says. He says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are fall have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, the Bible does give instances of pe other people who have been, who were resuscitated, who were brought back to life, uh, like Lazarus in, in John chapter 11. Uh, but none of those people were truly resurrected. They all died again. But in, in resurrection, what happened with Jesus, he didn't just come back to life with the same mortal body. He came back to life in an immortal body, a body that would last forever. But here's the point that I'm getting at here. In doing that, he opened the way for all of us to, to enter into that resurrection body, for us to spend eternity in Christ's kingdom. He shattered that barrier for us. So Paul talks about this later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Down in verse 50, he says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, he's talking about death, but we shall all be changed. And he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be, be changed. So without the resurrection, without Christ's resurrection, none of us would be able to spend eternity in his kingdom. Jesus broke through that death barrier so that he could open the way for us, for all of us to come through and to have life. Now that's what gives us hope, that we can have eternal life. Peter talks about it over in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he's celebrating this. He says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And he says, this resurrection is to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's what happens when you place your faith and your hope in the resurrection of Jesus. You're born again. You enter into a new life with the hope of, of an inheritance and a place in Christ's kingdom with this hope that one day you will be changed. You won't have this body that, that gets sick or, or, or is, is subject to death anymore. You'll be free from that to live forever with Christ. That's the hope of the resurrection. One more reason this morning that I want to share with you and it's what I'm calling the power. You know, when, when I was 15 years old, my parents bought a new car. And uh, the whole idea was that they were going to give the old car, my dad's old car, to me. And so here I was, I was 15, and I had the keys to a car. But I couldn't drive it yet. <laughs> um, you know, and everything we've seen about the resurrection kind of sounds like that. It's all these powerful, great things, but it, it all kind of, kind of focuses on the future. And so you might be wondering, what about now? 
what difference does the resurrection mean for me tomorrow morning? Right, when I have to go to work. Well, the Bible teaches us that the same power of God that raised Jesus from the dead and rolled the stone away is at work in the lives of believers today. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, Paul prayed that Christians would know of that power. He, he talked about what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So here's what this is getting at. You don't have to wait until you die to experience Christ's resurrection power. We certainly will experience it in the future, uh, but we, we experience it here and now. Well, what is it? How? What does that look like? Paul talks about it more. I know I'm jumping all over the place in the Bible this morning. Paul talks about it more in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. He says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So this resurrection power gives us newness of life now. What is that? As we read through Romans 6, we find out that it's, it's this freedom from sin. It's a freedom to, to serve God and freedom to, to honor Him. Further on in the chapter, down in verse 11, Paul says, You also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, you have to understand, sin blinds us. Okay, it keeps us from seeing truth. It enslaves us. You know how that feels, right? I mean, where there's something that you don't want to do. You know it's wrong. And yet you can't hold back. Right? That's, that's the power of sin. And apart from Christ, we have no ability to resist. No ability to say no. Uh, biblical truth... Um, for, for that to make sense to us, we have to have the resurrection. When we, when we believe in Christ's resurrection, what this verse says comes into play. We become alive to God. Uh, truth begins to make sense to us. We gain the ability to say no to temptation. That's the transformation that's brought about by the power of the resurrection. So to sum up then, this Believer's Guide, as I'm calling it. Uh, the Bible gives us five reasons to believe the resurrection of Jesus. First, because God's promise to restore all creation depends upon a king who can reign forever. Right? It's the promise. Secondly, because Jesus himself claimed that he would rise again. So you can't say that you believe in Jesus and, and, and doubt the resurrection or reject the resurrection. If... if if you believe in Jesus, you have to accept the resurrection. Third, we believe because of the witnesses who saw Christ after he rose from the dead and were willing to even die to tell people that truth. Fourth, we believe because Jesus, like we said, broke through the barrier of death to give us the hope of eternal life. And finally, we believe because we need the power of the resurrection at work in our lives to help us resist the temptation to sin. So, what's your response to all of that today? I think whenever we study God's Word, it, it deserves, uh, even demands, a response. And so on the, that communication card you were handed this morning, uh, it, it lists some possible responses. And I'd encourage you to consider sharing your response on that card so that I can be praying uh, for you. If you don't want to put your name, that's fine. If, if you just want to share, I, I can pray for you even if I don't know your name. But there's something about making a, a definite commitment. So the first response that I think of to these truths about the resurrection is for if you don't believe yet in the resurrection of Jesus, I encourage you to take that uh, first step today. 
to, to believe in the resurrection, to trust in Christ. And the reason that's so important is because over in Romans 10, verse 9, Paul says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Unless you, unless you believe, you can't have that hope of eternal life that we talked about. You, you won't get to be in Christ's kingdom. That's what this salvation is. You won't have that power to resist temptation, to overcome sin. And so I'd encourage you, if, if, if you've never trusted in Christ, accept that His resurrection is true today. And trust in His saving power to be at work in your life. It's as simple as, as, as making that choice. You know, it's so, it, it's so simple to do in a way that it's, we, we feel like we need to do something. To, to do something big and, and visible and, and difficult. But it's not, it's a, it just begins with a simple choice that I'm going to trust in the resurrection of Christ. Another response, if you're not ready yet to take that step of belief, I would encourage you to at least learn more. I'd recommend that you read uh, the account of the resurrection in Luke 24. We haven't done that this morning. We've jumped around to different places in the Scripture to develop these ideas about the resurrection. But just read the, the basic biblical account of the story. This decision about whether or not to believe in the resurrection of Christ, it's tremendously important. And so take some time to think through it. Read that account on your own. Think more about it. If you do believe in the resurrection of Jesus, another response is that you might benefit from memorizing Romans 6, verse 11, uh, to remind yourself of God's power at work in your life. That verse, remember it says, uh, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. At times it can just feel as if we have no other option but to give in to temptation. And yet with God's power, we can resist. We can say no. And so we need to constantly bear in mind that through believing in Jesus, exactly what this verse says, we've died to sin. It doesn't, it doesn't enslave us any longer. We can choose to obey. And we have God's power to help us do it. So Romans 6.11 and one more thought. Finally, if you believe in the resurrection, would you consider sharing your testimony with someone? It, it is. It's like, it's, it's, it's like reaching out to someone with, with the saving message. Right? To, to give them that same hope. As we saw earlier in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, I mean, that's, that's the mission that Christ has given to the church, to be witnesses to all the earth. People need to hear about the saving power of the resurrection. And, and along with that, they need to see its effect in our lives. So my prayer is that each of us would really know and understand uh, the power of Christ's resurrection in our lives. That that truth would bear great fruit in us.